Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Welcome to the Ask It podcast, a blend of spirituality, philosophy, and psychology, which rather than providing answers, considers good questions. Today we talk to psychotherapist Jerry Marzinski and therapist Sherry Hatfield about the MACE Energy Method of Healing, a revolutionary approach designed to permanently eliminate negative feelings, thoughts and emotions arising from over-identifying with past traumas and emotional disturbances. The key to a person being in charge of their life is not only to effectively manage these disturbances, but to totally eliminate them for good. Sounds too good to be true? Let's see what our guests have to say. I've not seen anything like it. You know, it, it's the only thing I've seen that really works. And the results were you know, amazing, especially with trauma. This wasn't invented by any psychiatrist or psychologist. It, it was invented by a, a genius mariner. The guy, the guy was a merchant marine ship captain. Mm. And and he, he he's brilliant. He just pieced together all these things that he'd read over his lifetime, and came up with a totally different concept of what the mind was. Can we can we start um, by the, the pair of you just kind of introducing yourselves? So um, obviously Jerry, you've been on with me before, but Sherry hasn't. So can we just kind of if, can you just give a quick background of both of you? So we okay. can. Yeah. You want to start, Sherry? Yeah. Uh, well, look, yes, I'll start. I'll look, a little bit about my background is early in my life, in my early 20s, I um, had a severe state of depression, an experience of severe state of depression, to the point that I couldn't be with my two children. And in that experience, I did come to that moment in my own inner world of deciding not to be here. And it was only through an experience that I had that the next morning um, from my making my decision that I woke up and I had a severe sore throat, so bad that I couldn't speak, hardly swallow. And so I took myself to the doctors for a sore throat. And it was in that moment that he had said, look, this is what's happening for you. We've got to get this back in balance for you. Within a couple of months, feeling high ascetic feelings and, and experiencing back with my children and family, there was a moment in my life as I was watching them play, so only little, that I had this how did I, how am I feeling this to how did I get to that? How did I get to those such low level feelings and decision? And so I've spent... 35 years of my life looking for that answer and so that took me on a very big path I had been working in childcare, but I took that in a lot deeper and um, they actually became my master teachers and with everything I'd learned I let go and I let them teach me and in a way it was a remembering and uh, and then of course I went into more of the esoteric meditation and then that of course involves self-inquiry and so if I did that for many many years I then branched out into more bringing that together within a child because I did have a lot of understanding of child development meaning you know emotionally mentally or cognitively as I like to say and you know morally all those elements that come together how we take things on at certain ages <clears throat> and of course my own self-inquiry and then 14 well, now 17 years ago, I should say, I had a personal crisis that was quite big to me. And uh, I resigned from all my work and, and I, I said, that, that's it, I'm done. And that in that passage by letting everything go, to me was the doorway to what was to come next. My decision was, I wanted to know why. Yes, I had had some understanding, lots of understanding. But to have that crisis and to experience everything come to the forefront again was like, I, I, I knew I didn't have the answer. And uh, But in that doorway, it opened me to meeting John Avery, 
which was John Mace's right-hand man, if you like. And it was in that moment that I actually went and had a session with him. And that was, that was it. And I knew in my own personal session, there was a moment that was like very deep inside me, I found it. And this is what I'll be taking forward. And that's how I'm here. I've been doing, so I'm a Mace Energy Method practitioner um, and trainer, but this is what I take forward in to help answer that question because that's what people are saying. Why do I keep doing this? How does this keep happening? The very nature they're asking why I'm wanting to come for help is because they know deep down it's not who and what they are. Well, we wouldn't be looking. Mm. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you. And my journey. Great. Yeah. Jerry? Yeah, my name is uh, Jerry Marzinski, and um, I've, I've spent virtually my entire career on the front lines of mental health. I started off at Central State Hospital in the state of Georgia working for uh, uh, psych there. Um, <clears throat> I was there for seven years. Uh, and it, it's there that I started learning that what I'd been taught in school didn't match reality on the front lines, uh, especially with as far as psychotics or schizophrenics. Um, they were saying it was a, a chemical brain imbalance that caused schizophrenia. But, you know, I never saw them ever give any kind of clinical test, blood work, EKG, e e nothing, no, no kind of test whatsoever to determine what was out of balance in these brains of these patients or by how much. Matter of fact, they didn't even know. There, there's, I don't know, 40, 40 some neurotransmitters in the brain. They don't even know what the chemical balance of the brain should be. It, it, it turned out to be a giant sham, you know, produced by the, the drug companies and the psychiatric mafia. So uh, after Central State Hospital, I, I went back for a PhD, spent a few years there, uh, hated it, absolutely hated it. Came back and I worked in mental health centers. Uh, I, I got a job in the psych department with the Arizona State Prison, and I worked with the criminally insane for 18 years. Uh, after I got out of there, I worked as a private contractor with local hospitals, and the last 10 years of my career, I spent working psych crisis in uh, the emergency rooms of the major hospitals uh, all over Tucson. Um, and I was always wondering, you know, what's going wrong with these people? Because psychology was real good at, and, and psychiatry too, at describing what was wrong with them, but they didn't know what to do about it. And nothing that they were doing was working. Uh, the regular kind of therapy that you're taught in college didn't work or didn't work well. And these drugs that the psychiatric mafia is dishing out are toxic. They're poisonous. Uh, the, uh, virtually everybody who's put on an antipsychotic drug will eventually go off it because they can't stand it. And then they'll go psychotic and then the whole merry-go-round goes again. So you know, working for the private psych hospitals, what I saw was these guys would go off their meds, they'd get put back in the hospital, they'd get be charged thousands of dollars to their insurance company or to their private funds. They'd be put back on meds, released, and then they'd go off them again and it would just be a big merry-go-round that just spun round and round and round and round with each each time destroying their brains. These, these antipsychotic drugs are very toxic. They shrink the patient's brain and they destroy the peripheral nerve nervous system with long-term use. But the psychiatric mafia won't tell them that. You know, they, they'll put them on clonopin and they'll mask those symptoms while they continue to poison their brains. So, you know, I, I was going, what is causing schizophrenia? And they didn't know. You know, they, they would say it was a chemical brain imbalance. I could see for myself that wasn't it. Uh, I saw that 80% of the research articles that psychology puts out couldn't be replicated. So they were no, no more than BS, you know, so yeah, a small percentage were, were valid. So it, it was like, okay, I, I need to look for myself and see what's going on. The first thing I wanted to know was what are these voices and what are they telling these people? And lo and behold, I got into trouble with psychiatry for asking these patients about what their voices were and what they were saying. Um, I found that it was the voices that drive paranoid schizophrenia. 
it's no chemical imbalance. It's no genetic anything. It's these voices, and these voices run se separate, repeatable, consistent patterns. And so the psychiatric mafia is saying, well, they're hallucinations. No, anything that runs consistent, repeatable patterns is not a hallucination. Mm. So then I went to, okay, what are these patterns and what happens if I disrupt them? And I found that if you disrupt those patterns, the voices get pissed off. You know, they take it personally. And then they start weakening depending on how disrupted the pattern was. But one thing interesting I found was that these voices have complete access to the, the memory of these people. So they can go in there and they can pull up all the rotten things that they've ever done and they can rub them in their faces. Mm -hmm. And so they, they can pull up stuff that the patient doesn't even remember. Now, that's where Cherie's system came in. Um, I, when I first, <laughs> a friend of hers emailed me, and I get a lot of strange emails, believe me. And he just basically said, I got somebody you need to meet. And uh, then he added to that, uh, the worst that could happen is that you'd see a, a jolly grandma. <laughs> and I, I said, well, that doesn't sound too bad. And, uh, you know, I kind of tucked it away and then, yeah, I better, I think I better follow this one up. Something in me told me I, th I need to follow this up. And then I met Cherie and yeah, I was suspicious like like you were listening to and I was hitting her with all kinds of questions and what do you do here and what do you do there? There was enough in the book written by John Mace where I, I could begin putting this stuff to use and I could see it working and I could see it working fast and accurately. Um, but they, there's some parts they left out that was real frustrating because I'd, I'd hit those and I'd go, well, wh where do I go here? Where do I, what do I do there? But there was enough in there to actually see it work. And what's so cool about this system um, is it takes the spirit of the person into account. And that mm. spirit will guide the therapist to the hidden stuff that's buried that they don't have access to. That is called uh, 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 negative identity. So what happens to, normally is when, when you run into a crisis, um, you, you have a, uh, you don't like the feeling, you don't like what happened, it, it gets buried. It yeah. gets buried alive. You know, and the ego buries it and keeps it buried and then will project it out onto everybody else. And it's triggered by somebody else with those same aspects. So if somebody has the same negative traits, they come into your sphere, this negative identity reacts. It doesn't respond, it reacts. So there's a flare up and then that the ego drives that person away. It's like trying to put two ends of the same magnet together, put two negative poles together and they repel each other. Well, that's the same thing the negative identity does. So the ego buries this crap, keeps it buried, doesn't want to face it, doesn't want to look at the ugliness of it, keeps it buried. So it keeps getting triggered by other people with those same characteristics. So no matter how many, the more traumas you have, the more of these that are buried. So they're like landmines. You keep hitting a landmine after landmine after landmine after landmine. Now you can do something about the ones you know about. It's the ones you don't know about that cause the problems. You know, and that's where Cherie's system is just majestic because it uses the spirit to help find the buried stuff and then pull it out and discharge it. Um, and, and what's so cool about this is it wasn't invented by any psychiatrist or highfalutin, high you know, uh, PhD or, or psychologist. It, it was pieced together by a, a, a person I think is an absolute genius after reading what he wrote. Uh, he pieced this together from all the stuff he was reading, philosophy, and, and uh, he was widely read. He was a, a marine, a, a what do you call it? Merchant Marine Captain. So he would drive these big merchant ships, you know, and he was he was very good at that. And then got a job as a, uh, uh, I think it was a, a tugboat uh, captain or a harbor master in Australia. So he could start working with this stuff. And, and then he put it out and he goes, this is what I discovered. And what's so interesting about it is that it it works and it works because it looks at the mind in a very different way. You know, it doesn't look at the mind in the way that most people think the mind functions. You know, it looks at the mind as a device that creates an image or a picture of wherever you focus your attention. And the spirit is what takes the place of what most people call the mind. You know, so 
so uh, hold found. on a minute hold on a minute jerry what say that again so yeah say that again so the, the what most people consider the mind at least in england and in, in, in english um in the western world except for germany that doesn't have a word for mind which is interesting um so the mind in the mace method is is conceptualized as a mental device that creates an image of wherever you focus your attention. Yeah. So it creates a mental image. And that's all it does. It doesn't do any of the processing. It doesn't do any of the judging. It doesn't do any of the thinking. That's done to that's done by the entity or the spirit or what John Mace calls the energetic entity. Right. That's the that's the one that does the thinking and the processing and the calculating and, and all the stuff normally attributed to the mind. So what's cool about this is that John found that once you can put an emotion or a concept into an image, then it can be gotten rid of. It can be dissolved. And once the 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 spirit or the um, energetic entity leads you to where that stuff is buried you can pull it up you can form it into an image and then that trauma can be dissolved and it no longer has a charge that negative identity can be dissolved it no longer has a charge it's more a memory than a charge and yeah, I'll, I'll use anything that works the whole time that i was uh, on the front lines i would use anything that i saw worked i didn't care how ridiculous it was but when i started using this stuff you know, I, I read the book and it, it, was, it was instantaneous. It was just boom, boom, boom. It was quick. It was accurate. It was fast. And there was no bull crap about it. You didn't have to. And what's even more amazing is you, the therapist does not have to know anything about what the problem is. Nothing. All they need to know is what the feeling is and, and maybe a little bit about the situation. They don't have to tell about, oh, I was raped or I was, you know, all this stuff people don't want to talk about. All they have to do is is let you know the feeling and and the intensity of the feeling and what's going on with these images that they're working with. So it's completely private. It's all going on within the head of the patient himself, you know, which is absolutely amazing. You know, most therapists can't um, imagine they're not knowing what the person is talking about. You don't have to know. They don't have to know it. They can keep it completely private as long as they're following the instructions and we're getting the feedback that we need. It can be gotten rid of. And it, it's working with schizophrenics. With nothing else works with them. So I found that it works, it works very well with moderate cases or mild cases of schizophrenia. Works pretty well with uh, moderate cases. And it, <laughs> it's very difficult with, with uh, people who are uh, too far gone. They have to be able to understand what you're saying and follow the directions. And I've worked with uh, schizophrenic patients where the voices would interfere and they'd start mocking the person and, and slamming them around and, and doing stuff to them. And this stuff still worked. You know? So it's the only therapy that I know that works with schizophrenics. And, and there is not, nothing else other than these toxic meds that the psychiatric mafia is pushing along with big pharma. And those don't work. They, they temporarily numb the person. They don't get rid of the voices, um, and they're awful meds. They're just awful. They, they're you know, they they don't cure anything. They cure nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay, Sherry, what what would you, what would you like to add or to to what Jerry said about the mace method? I, I think he expressed it beautifully and summed it up in its um, simplicity. Um, you know, just to edify what he was saying uh, is, you know, it's the inherent power and the simple power of your own being. That is the component that keeps being left out. And yet yes. it's where we begin. Yes, yeah. exactly. And you it's know, not to be found in psychiatry or psychology. It's absolutely yeah. absent. Yeah. 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 And it, it, Which, it, 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 Sorry, carry on, Sherry. Well, oh, you know, which is aligned with our awareness, you know, and in meditation and, you know, psychologists are now, you know, go and meditate or yoga. I mean, the pointer that's in there, they're pointing to, you know, do this as a thing to do, 
but the very thing they're giving them to do has very deep principles. And of course, it talks, th th the place it leads you to is the real you, which is not persona, it's awareness or spirit or as, jo as Jerry said, um, John brought it in as energy being or energy entity. And that was just to take it out of any dogmas because we can all agree, even science is proving that now, it's everything is energy. Yeah. So some people might know that as the, the witnessing self or the observing self. Ab absolutely. Yeah. 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 You have to have awareness. You have to be, you know, that's why I say to clients, like, what's wrong with me or what is this? And we don't get into that as Jerry is pointing to. But, you know, you're edifying that person. And I say to them, you've done nothing wrong. Isn't it interesting your language says, I notice I do this, I do that. I said, who's the, who's the one that's noticing that? And I just sort of stopped and they go, me. I said, well, then you know you can't be it. It's always there. How do you know you exist? I just do. It's just that awareness. So I'll, you know, we'll probably get into that a little bit more and Jerry will expand on that as well is that we identify very much to our roles and identities you know when we're introducing ourselves or when we ask about someone it's all very much our stats yeah how old you know married single you know there's stats how many children do you have what do you do for work and i say to a lot of people look we're just going to take if you just took all your roles off just take them all off for a minute and what's left? That's um, like that, that. That's like that Zen meditation where you sit in pairs and your partner just keeps asking you, "Who are you? Who are you?" And you you go you start off with, "Well, I'm Lucinda. I'm a psychotherapist. Blah blah. I'm a mum. Blah blah blah." And you go through all of those roles as you're saying, Sherry, and and then you get to the point where, well, who, who the hell am I? <laughs> and yeah. all sorts. And then when I, when I first did that meditation years ago all sorts of emotion came up, anger, the crying, or all sorts of stuff, because who, who are you under all of that? Yeah, and that's what the children really started inside me, because when you watch children and they go into home corner, they role model their primary caregivers. We'll start there and they're earlier, so they play mummy or daddy. You know, they're primary caregiver. And then as they interact with the world and the different roles that are there, they start to role play that. They would walk into home corner like that, be mummy, daddy, you know. And as soon as they walk out of that invisible line, I mean, home corner, they'd come back to themselves. And because our role in a childcare setting is to observe, not analyze, observe. I kept seeing that. It got finer. It's like, what is that? So I came home one night, and because it had so much of my attention, I thought, I'm going to do what they do. So I've come home. I'm getting ready for bed, actually. And I thought, well, I'm finished for the day. I've finished playing. So I'm going to take off my mother role. I'm going to take off my childcare role. I'm going to take. And I was just doing that conceptually. And next minute, I had this huge, like, emotion. But it was this insight emotion. And it was, oh, my God, here I am. I had that experience. I don't need a name. I don't need a role. I spent 27 years to get to that. And here I am. I'm, I'm none of my roles. I just damn. And, you know, when they, you read the esoterics of that, I mean, I'd be like, where is that I am? You're always there. But it's and just for, the identification. For, for me, it was getting out of my body for a short period of time and think that I was still alive and I wasn't thinking and I, I was just awareness, a moving awareness. And I'm like, wow, yeah. you know, this is who I really am, you know, beside all the roles, mm -hmm. beside the body, beside all the senses that are constantly distracting you. This is who's there. Yeah. And the Mace Method takes Beautiful. advantage yeah. of that. It's a bit yes. like the, it's a bit like the kind of non-dual. I don't know even how to language it beyond that. 
but it's a, it's the kind of non-dual practice. It's not even a practice. But where the, I hear where you're coming from. Yeah. Yes, you can say it fits many. Yeah. It's because, and Jerry, I think, said it beautifully. It's what do we do about it? What we've got all these principles and pointers, and, and there are beautiful truths in all of them. But it was, I came to the same spot, but yeah, but I'm still doing it. What, what do I do with that? That's when causism and mace, that's where it comes in. Here we go. Yeah, that's where the rubber this meets it, the road. This is it in action. Yeah, absolutely. It, this is it in action. Yes. And, well, where the, uh, the other things are like, you know, well, well, you know, the, and matter of fact, in a lot of cases, it makes people worse. Oh, this happened to me. That happened to it just brings it all up and they're waddling in it again for the billionth time. And it doesn't help anything. You know, that, that's where the beauty of the maze system comes in. Um, I know this may be hard for some of you guys that aren't therapists to follow through with this. But uh, John Mace wrote a book. Um, what is it? Uh, Something over causism, causes oh, energy was, over mind, energy over mind. You know, for for you therapists out there, it'll give you the basic principles that you can put to use yourself and see for yourself how this stuff works. And you don't have to be a uh, a brain surgeon to be able to do this. A anybody can do it. You know, it get, of course it gets more complex and deeper as as Cherie has. Uh, more than adequately showed me the further along you get, the deeper it gets and the more intriguing I find it. But the basic principles can be put to work, work from, from the book. And, you know, I was using them before I, you know, even got, got into it further with Cherie. I'm going, up, well, I don't need to use anything. I mean, this works. What do I need more for? You know, but yeah, <laughs> I found out later <laughs> that that was the tip of the iceberg, but it does work. <laughs> So I suppose what joins us joins yeah. us all together, uh, us three, before we even get into this practice, is that we all think that it's absolutely necessary that we talk about the spiritual self of people, uh, because yes. as you, as you said, Jerry, that that's just not really in our in our training, and if it is, it's a kind of cursory just nod to that, and nobody really knows what that even means. And really, that's in my own little way, that's I guess that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make my colleagues aware that there's this whole dimension. Well, that, that is our essential being that, that they're not taking into account. Well, I hope you have a tough hide. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> well, I do now after working with Sherry. <laughs> so, OK, yes. but, so I just want to fire off some thoughts and, and see where what you two think of them so the kind of over the last few years it seems to me that we've started to think about trauma differently and we recognize that trauma can exist in the body as a memory as a, as a consciousness in in the body if we want to talk about it that way so sherry how does that concept relate to the ridges that you were you were talking about when when i had a session with you so, Jerry, you said, and also you said to me, Sherry, that when when something difficult is happening, something challenging is happening, and it generates a strong feeling in us that we that we find uncomfortable or too painful, or we just don't want to engage in that feeling, we try to push that away or or stop that. And I think my understanding of what you said, Sherry, is that it creates some kind of ridge, some energetic ridge. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you resist persists. So, you know, it's like you're pushing away a glass of water away from you, you're still hanging on to that glass of water while you're pushing it away. Yeah. So what happens is ego buries that stuff so it doesn't have to deal with it and then forgets about it, but it's still buried alive. You know, but it takes a lot of energy to keep it buried because it keeps wanting to pop up. You know, so you know, that's positive energy that you could be using for something else if you could get in there and release it, which traditional therapies are really poor at doing. Yeah. 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 So, Sherry, you want to answer? Course it's a, yeah, the, about yeah, the body? Look, that, well, we see it as these energy ridges impinge on the body because these, we start with the spirit and, and, you know, when we're doing a session, 
we're not talking about all that. We're we're yeah. just getting in because it's feelings is where we experience it. So we're going to help people deal with unwanted thoughts and feelings. That's where they're aware because they're aware of the manifestation of it. They feel it, they hear it, and of course it feels non-survival, it doesn't feel good, and that's why they're on the self-help journey. I don't like this feeling, This I, I don't want it. And they're trying to solve the problem. So, but where we're working from, where we're actually working from is working with their being, their energy, their awareness, uh, who they really are, all those words we're trying to point to. And, you can and track so these all things. these energy ridges, yeah, 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 and these you can track these down. Stored yeah. Within, yeah, you can track these down through trauma, you know, because when yeah. when there's a trauma, that's where these things are buried. A career S, and we actually create them via upset or trauma. When something comes towards us, we do not like to feel of. We are naturally going to use our energy to resist it. It feels a pro survival act at the time, but of course, as Jerry's saying, it gets buried. We bury it. We didn't like the feeling of it. And we certainly don't come back after the event to try and process it. We're in little bodies. We're not cognitively. That's very different. Awareness is always there. But, of course, then what Jerry was trying communicating was something else comes along and triggers that feeling again. But instead of us being able to handle it, we just do the same thing. I'm going to give it some more energy. There's that feeling. And we resist it. And the more and more you resist it, the more and more energy you're having to use to do so. Yeah. That's that positive potential. Jerry's saying if you had energy, back to you. But, of course, that's you don't know it's happening. This is done a little unconsciously, a lot unconsciously. And, of course, then over time, we identify with it. And that's why we call it a negative identity. But and it's really more, just... The, the more of those that you have buried, the more unstable you become. And schizophrenics have a lot of them that are buried. You know, so the, a process of, of getting yeah, rid of one after the other after uh, the other. Yeah. So when you say it's a consciousness... What you, what you were uh, sharing there, Lucinda, it's a, a, a consciousness. Your energy is an intelligence. Our spirit, you could, it's, a, it's energy that can store knowledge and experiences. It's an intelligence, not intellect. That's very different. And so what, what's happening, if we just slow it down, we, we seem to, because this is the invisible. We can't see it. Yeah. You can't see a feeling either. It's very subjective. We can see its effects. Someone might act it, or we feel it in on our body as an experience, but it's still all the invisible, it's the abstract there. Is that is the essence of your consciousness. It is the aliveness. It's whatever you give that energy to gives it life and meaning to you. So what they're calling the trauma and that creates a consciousness, no, it's your active intelligence, your energy, giving it life. That's why Jerry's saying buried alive. <laughs> so it's giving these thoughts and feelings life. Or keeping them active, keeping them alive. And not real-time feelings and thoughts anymore. So that's why people are saying they are a consciousness because, yes, these identities, because it's filled with negative thoughts, feelings, concepts, and ideas, which become our behaviors, and then mm -hmm. we say it's us, this is what I'm doing, um, it feels very real. You see from it. You see the world from it. Yeah, despite, course, the fact that you, despite the fact that you're not your thoughts or your feelings. That's not Correct. who you are. Correct. Yes. And well, okay. Okay. Let me let me throw in a question. Because um, most like perennial philosophies that are found in most spiritual teachings and indeed most religions um, 
would 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 say that wouldn't they that that we, we are we are not we are we are spirit essentially we are not our thoughts we are not our feelings but what i think sometimes gets lost this is just my my understanding my belief is that we're we're human incarnate for a reason because for the pure fact that this body does feel it does experience emotions and it's only through this body that we can have that sensory experience here on planet earth so i suppose if i'm really transparent that's one of my issues and maybe i've understood stood you incorrectly and so you'll 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 tell me but it's almost like when you say jerry we're not our thoughts and we're not our feelings i ha i have a problem with that i understand okay. that we can over identify with it with our narrative from years ago right well look yeah look at it you might, you might look at look at it like this way you, you this this is like a spacesuit <laughs> you know you're in the spacesuit yeah so, or or like you get into a car and you start driving the car yeah you know it's it's the, the car you're not the car you know the car is your vehicle your body is the vehicle you know your eyes are the headlights you're you, you know the, this is a physical manifestation but you are a spir spiritual being you're a spiritual entity that that drives this vehicle and yeah, yeah this I have vehicle no does problem see. with that i absolutely yeah. i absolutely agree with that but but it's almost as though we're saying well our feeling self is is redundant or is uh, is a red herring and, okay. and yeah <clears throat> This is where language, we run into trouble. Yeah. So what is a thought? It's Damn words it. in yes. a sentence. Yeah. Yes. Where do words come from? It's language. We developed it as human beings. So what Jerry's pointing to is you are not a thought meaning you are not the words. Yes. You are before the thought. It is something that we use. And thought, when we really, when we're using it in that context, oh, I had a thought. It's actually a past tense. So you've heard something. Yes. I've heard something. Yes. When we're being and using words and language to communicate, a very subjective um, awareness or concept or idea, can't see them either, we're using words and language to do that. But the words and language is not the thing. It's your idea or the intuitive or the understanding of something that you're then trying to bring forward with the words. So yes. you are before the words, you are not the words, Yes. So that's what, when we're saying we are not our thoughts, who's the one that's having them or aware of the thought? So the yeah. thought can't be you. Now, there's a difference between feeling, sentient, and then emotion or emotional content, especially negative emotional content. All low self-esteem, negative thoughts and feelings about yourself, compulsive behaviors, uh, depression, anxiety are the effect of a negative identity. That, yes. that, that's what creates that. Yeah. So you're not the emotional, you're not all the emotional uh, content. You are not your anger. You are aware that you're experiencing this feeling of anger, but you are not the anger you are before there has to be something that it's experiencing it yes so that's what jerry and where we're pointing to when we say things quickly like you are not your thoughts and feelings it's not to make you invalid it's to slow this down to who's using that word i had a very wonderful friend that said to me once you know a lot of people are walking around licking the menu of uh, looking at the menu and the picture of a steak instead of eating it there's a lot of theorizing going on out there talking all this stuff and the word is not the thing they're not eating the steak 
Yeah. That's what we're trying to point to. Yeah, and that's, that's critical. That's where mice with, comes on in. Yeah, and working with so, schizophrenics, that's that's critical because the, the voices they are hearing are not who they are. And if they can't make that distinction, they're going to be gone. There's nothing that is going to be able to help them. They have to formulate that distinction between what they, who they are and what these voices are, what these other thoughts are, you know, and, and that's determined by intent. So, you know, they have to ask where do thoughts come from? How does this, how does mice fit and your new understanding of this, Jerry, how does that fit with your, what your knowledge that you previously came to that the voices with schizophrenics were negative entities? And, and not I, st I, I still believe that because of the number of experiences I've had with them. Yeah. But I think they build up to it with these negative identities. So the more negative identities there are, the more disturbed and upset and unstable the person becomes until these identities kind of form a personality of their own and take over. You know, they, they, that's the that's what they're after. They want to take over the person. And that's what these identities do too. They they drive you, they they control you, and you, and a lot of times you don't even know it because they're unconscious, they're buried. But yeah, I I, I still believe the the voices are that schizophrenics here are entities. They're different than the person. They are parasitic because every time they show up, the person's energy becomes it's drained. They have no energy. And that's a there's a one to one correlation between the voices showing up and the the amount of energy that that person has. It's it's just sucked out. I, I have no idea how they do it, but it's consistent. And all, it, none of this stuff psychiatry is looking into. All they're all they're looking into is oh yeah, just we'll just drug everybody. We'll turn you into a zombie so you don't feel anything, and and then you walk around like a zombie. You know. This stuff actually will get in there and remove these these negative identities, and it works for all range of people. I mean, it works for, you know, maybe maybe it doesn't work well with the the very chronic, regressed schizophrenics, but it works for virtually everything else. I um, interviewed a guy called Thomas Sinza, wonderful guy. He was a hypnotherapist. And in, in essence, he, he was he'd kind of come to the same conclusion that and it's a bit like the kind of shamanic view, actually, that when there's a, a trauma, part, that part of you splits off and another identity is created to manage the trauma and the split off part or the or the identity, the original identity actually does have a whole um, will and existence of its own so that's not that far really from what you're the concept that you're both talking about is yeah, it protects itself through the through uh projection yeah you know so the, it it throws that out on everybody else so it doesn't have to face it in itself the ego doesn't so you know it, it it'll throw it on somebody else and then drive that other person away you know so well, in a way, he was going one step further and saying that those identities actually have a will and a being and and uh, and are psychic beings in and of themselves. Yeah, but they don't have any energy in and of themselves. They have of to get themselves. that from you. Yeah. Yeah. And here's where a language comes in again. So, yes, these identities, so from our point of view, we resist an unwanted feeling. And of course, creates an energy ridge and stored within that energy ridge is all the effects of a trauma. That's what creates a negative identity. We call that a negative identity because over time, each time it's being triggered, it's getting your positive potential, giving it life. And so, yes, when it's activated, it will act and you will speak it, act it completely. But that's how fast it is. You're yeah. saying it's me. So our language again, so from our point of view, and, you know, he, of course he's on it. We're all going to head, if there is one principle and a truth that we're all going to head there, we're all trying to do that. But, of course, we're doing a lot with language and, and what sort of knowledge we've had prior, what wording, and trying to piece that together to communicate it. But here's where 
I'm going to try and help these entities or these negative identities that we create, persona, which also means ma, is not a self. It has energy in it, and with anything with energy in it, it is going to act, and it will act as it is. But it's not an ent. It's not a life force of its own. It's only got life with our energy and potential. That's what the Mace Energy Method is doing. We're bringing out your energy out of resistance. That's its purpose, and therefore all that cannot exist. Yeah. The energy returns unto you. So some of this language, like it's got a will of its own, it doesn't have a will of its own. It has your energy and potential in it. So it can act. And yes, he's right. You know, John talks about the roles and identities we have, and he gives an example of a man because they're purposeful. We are in a material universe. I'm going to come back to what you spoke earlier. Yes, we're an energy being, and we're having a, a physical material experience. Yeah, But roles and identities are something we use, languages we use that is pro-survival and purposeful for our pro-survival. So a woman, uh, you know, one of the examples John uses is the only reason you go and get a driving identity is because of its pro-survival to you. And it gives, it solves a problem. These are all problem solving for our daily life. But what happens is we start to identify with them as a self instead of us, that is what I'm using it for. So if I lived in Hong Kong, there is no way I would need a driving identity. The public transport system there is amazing. But here in Australia, with the vastness of what we live in, and we don't have that type of public transport. I want to go places. I want to take my children places. I'm going to get a driving identity. I'm going to create one. <clears throat> we also have positive identities. Remember that we're, we're, we're honing in on some of the negatives, but we have positive roles and identities. What we call negative identities are something we unknowingly create and accidentally create via upset or trauma. Because when something comes towards us, we do not like to feel of, we're going to use our energy to resist it. And that's how it gets our energy and potential. Yeah. It's a little unconscious. So because we did create it, means we can discreate it. And really all we're doing, the only life it has is your energy and resistance. So your positive potential is trapped with all these negative thoughts and feelings, which will act. As what it is, that feeling, this thought, that concept, that idea, I'm not good enough. You lacked it. We bring your energy and potential home unto the source. This doesn't exist. And that's why people, when we finish the session, I say to them, I want you to say that. Can you say you feel that? And they go, they just laugh. No, I can't. So you also have positive roles and identities. You don't see it as... Uh, you're discreating them or not using them, but you've got many roles or identities that you've played that were positive to you back in your past that you don't use now. And you've probably got a lot that uh, you're creating new. You know, now that the world of podcast has come into our life, we never could, you know, it was only radio show host now there's a lot of us that can create a podcast radio host identity does mm. that make sense yeah so there all your positives but these and who who is enlivening that who is creating that who is perfecting that you and then you'll come out of your podcast identity and then you might go and see your daughter or son, you know, if you're a parent, and then you come into this mother roller identity. But it's really a purposeful uh, material, physical thing that we do. How can I point to that? So what makes a mother role? It's really a 
parenting role. So I like to bring it back to our natural state, watch mammals. They birth a baby and it's all instinct and they take care for the survival of that species for their baby. And they have their mechanisms to do so. We're going to use language and say, that's a mother, that's a female. We're pointing to what we're seeing and understanding. So when we have a baby, you know, the role in our West is called a mother. It just means that you're a parent. You have a young. Then we have all these concepts and ideas of how a mother should be. Or we've had experiences with our own parenting. This is where it becomes all conceptual, our experiences and identification. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So they're purposeful and practical in the material universe or in our daily life. You know, I love playing with, you know, I, I think I said to you, um, Lucinda, they're purposeful. I'm having a problem uh, with my health. So, of course, I need to go and find someone that can help me with the problem of my health. And people who want to work with people in helping heal may study and I want to help heal bodies and I'm going to study this area so I can help others. And so they will develop a role. So let's say my problem in my health is I have a bad tooth. And there's people that want to help people with their teeth because that can, you know, bad tooth can kill you. Yeah. And so they've realized that this is an important thing i want to study that i want to do that so i'm going oh, i've got a really bad tooth who do i need to call i'm going to call the person who has studied all about teeth and knows how to help me with that and the role we actually give him is called a dentist so we're going to ring a dentist so i know who to call and as i teach my young you know if you ever have bad teeth i want you to ring a dentist i have i want to do something with my hair and of course, then there's people out there who love playing with hair, learn all about how to color hair. The whole, there's a whole, you know, it's four years to do be a hairdresser. We don't realize how much they learn. Um, and of course, I'm not going to ring a dentist to have do my hair. The person we call that does hair and learns all this, knows how to cut hair and style hair and do all sorts of things with as a hairdresser. So they're purposeful. Their roles and we play as a society for problem solving of life and living but we've come a little bit too identified if you look at the western world it's what we put first is social stats and there are you know i'm a doctor i'm a lawyer oh i'm just a cleaner we've all heard that no you you first then there's roles that you play but there's been given authority to certain roles which then limits the person. And that's why I respect Jerry and, and um, you know, even you, Lucinda, it's that explore, there's you first. Hang on, there's something not right here. Um, it's not just this body of knowledge. And actually I'm the one that's learning the body of knowledge and I'm seeing something. And the body of knowledge isn't quite doing it. And then when you start bringing you through to explore, which that's our nature, something's not being answered. The problem is not being solved. Jerry, you can see this, pro this is not solving the problem. It's going to keep driving. That's the will. That belongs to you. You'll keep looking. These, what happens is this becomes then uh, solidified, concrete. This is how it is. And then you're limited. So that's when people start going, well, you know, I either walk away from that, but I'm going to keep going. It's what happened with John Mace. It's what Jerry's doing. It's what I did. It's what you're doing, Lucinda. It's not what psychiatry and psychology is doing. It's like they teach it. This is the way it is. This is the truth. And what I hated about psychology, there was no way to check out anything they were saying. You know, you, you don't even have access to a clinical population until you get up to the master's degree, and that's only limited. 
you know, and then in a PhD, you hardly have any access to a clinical population. And most of the professors that I was dealing with didn't have any real clinical experience. They got it all from books as this guy said it to this guy who stole it from this guy who wrote, wrote it from this guy. And it, it's, it's like these little fish I remember I saw when scuba diving, you know, they, they were in these little holes at the bottom of the ocean and one would leave to go get a rock and then another one would come and steal one of his rocks from his little hole, you know, and, and they were stealing rocks from each other. The only ones who were bringing in fresh material to the community were the ones who would venture outside of the, you know, that little community and get the rocks from outside and bring them in. You know, that reminds me of psychiatry and psychology. They, they're just stealing rocks from one another. You know, this guy wrote this and then you put all these references down and it's like, but you ask them, well, what do you do about it? And they go, oh, well, we, we don't really know. I mean, you just talk about it and, and, and drug, drug them silly. You know, nothing, nothing works. It doesn't just doesn't work. Yeah. So, Sherry, what's what's yeah. your view? And we've got to be careful. You know, I use a lot. Of, yeah. On. Uh, on on um, Jerry's experience of external negative entities attaching to people. Earlier in my piece, I have a respect for it. Um, and I, that's why I say to Jerry things like, or oh, I have said, on, I'm not saying there is or there isn't, because that's not what I'm pointing to. I want to point to the power of you first. It's what I'm trying to point to is that you do have the power. And it ties in with all this very much, um, you know, role psychologists and psychiatrists know you better than anybody. You know, no one knows you better than anybody than you. Yeah, And if before psychology and psychiatry, we have to use a little bit of history. What did we have before? Who gave them the authority that they had the authority? Yeah, good question. Before that, we had, yeah, before that, we had religion. If we sort of go back in history, there were shamans. If we go into different areas, there, there were, you know, doctors. and But religion, it was the priests that told you where you were at, who you were, and what you were doing. I sometimes look at psychiatry and psychology if we're not careful. You know, I'm not saying all oh, there are good, some good explorers and discoverers there, who they are as people first, not their role. Are starting to do the same thing. You need to be very careful. So, in light of your question with Jerry. You know, we're big energy beings. We just happen to have ours playing out with the body. Entities, if you want to start, you know, there's astral levels of consciousness. You've got the buddhic, atmic, you know, we could go into all that. But when you drop your body, everything is stored within your energy universe. Just experiences. And that's why when you can come and have another body, they can be activated, if you like. These are energy ridges. That's why people can have experience past life. They're not actually having a past life because they're in this body, but they're accessing experiences in their energy universe where they had a body maybe in a past life. Like Mozart. What we would call a past life. Yes, yes. Because all that knowledge and everything you've ever experienced is stored within your energy being. So you don't lose that. That also comes into other conversations. So when you drop your body, if there's an identification on that level, which is negative, and they're entities, we'll call that entities outside of you. That's negative energy. And it will act, it's got source energy in it. And it's just playing out on that level of consciousness because that's where it that's where it can only be. This type of energy can't access high echelons of life. Just like when you and I, in our physical experience, when we were down in those feelings, it was all real. I had people around me that were, resonated the same, like Jerry's saying, like attracts, you know, you're just in it. And that's life and that's how it is. And of course, then something happens, you have an experience and you start, oh, hang on a minute. Now that, to me, that's the real you, activating that. 
And so you start raising your vibration, you start learning, you start seeing things from a different perspective and you have these high echelon different feelings. Life starts flowing very differently. Can you see where I'm pointing? We've had that physically as an experience. And then we're meeting people that's so trapped here they can't get out. We're trying to come in and say, you know, it's okay. You don't have to live like that. And they're going, you're nuts. Mm -hmm. Don't be ridiculous. Life is bullshit. If it's one principle, it's exactly the same for what we can't see, you know, entities, Wakido, all this, you know, you can call it the collective unconscious. There's so many pointers, but I want to just point, if I point to a principle, because I'm not negating anything. Yes, there can be negative energy. We can even feel it in a house. Yeah. People that have lived there prior and there's been a lot of negativity. We walk in the house and go, oh, I don't like the feeling of that. We're energetic beings, transmitters, receivers. We're going to feel it. Yeah. So the energies, entities, are st that, that is a stark level of energy. And yes, whether you've got a body or not, we can connect. Because if you're vibrating at that rate, this is vibrating at that rate, you identify with it. No different than if you're at, we, we speak in therapy and all that type of thing. If you're a negative person, you attract negative people and you're just around negative people. So yes, there can be attachments or really it's identification too. And that's why when we've come together jerry and i and how life did that you know nothing i don't see it as separate it's like okay what is this i've had experiences with the esoteric and the astral absolutely and there used to be a lot of fear around that but the one principle back then was it can only connect to you if you're vibrating at the same rate that's homeopathy they're natural laws Mm -hmm. so and jerry pointed that out very beautifully in the beginning of this conversation whereas we create the energy ridge and then we start to see people that mirror that or if someone has those same qualities and traits anger da, 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 it's going to activate yours yeah and then you're going to experience so then if you discreate yours and this person's doing that you're like so it's exactly the same law for the entities. And that's where Jerry is seeing that principle. And so he's expanding into another level. We just focus on discreating it here. That energy cannot feed on your energy to keep active. So, Sherry, what... can't feed off that. Does that make sense? It does. That makes sense. What, mm -hmm. what happens in the here and now for you be, being this aware knowing that you are an energetic being but what what happens for you in your interactions with other individuals if something happens that triggers a feeling in you what i ring a mace practitioner sorry i ring a mace practitioner <laughs> and she does <laughs> She's yeah. so look there's a with... difference between yeah so there's a difference between some things, you know, you know so that, see, I, I have so many questions of clients that come in, that, like, will I be doing this forever? Well, no. We're just creating these big ridges. So someone may say something to me. If I don't have a big ridge around it or an identity, remember they're activating the identities that we've unknowingly created way back when. Yeah. So I have more awareness that it's like made me feel that, but I'm no longer identifying, if you like, uh, with the feelings it's like oh what's that sensation i certainly don't name it as quick either that's like well what is that so i've got more space if you like if it's a trigger where i'm going oh my god how is that but la 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 oh how dare they ra 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 and i'm still going an hour later i ring a maze practitioner and because it's something that's been activated i didn't know that first it's activated i'm and now i'm becoming aware and because i'm hearing it go on i have the space especially now if you're talking to me now i have the space to go oh hang on a minute 
And because if there's a bit of, you know, I can look at it. See, this is very, it makes it difficult because again, we're trying to point to something where I've had the experience, Jerry's had the experience, you've had the experience. If you watch children, I'm going to try and point on life where we've all seen it. Children experience the feeling and then it's done. Yes. So before language, so we're going to come before words again. They experience it, express it, there's nothing around it, and then it's done. And it's to communicate something. Hungry, scared, um, hurt, you know, they've fallen over and they just cry. But they put no story on it or words. And if you listen to all the words and stories you actually have, it's come from your parents. You just fell over. This is this is what would be in the now, no words, being, it is what it is. <laughs> fell over, impact of the knee. I'm still having to give it language, but it hurt. And you, oh, we come and go, oh, that really hurt. That was the language. Yeah. I'll go and fix it for you. You're okay. All that. So there's language to comfort. But this is where you start to learn and you'll see the child as they develop that go, I just hurt my knee. That's not what they're feeling. I don't know. Can you hear where I'm pointing? Yes. yes. Well, animals, animals now, well, do the it. same thing. You know, you, you look yes. at a lion chasing a, a gazelle and the thing's running for its life. It's almost gets caught. I mean, if it gets away, then it, it stops at a safe distance, looks around. And goes back about its business. It doesn't sit there and remunerate <laughs> yes. over and over and over. Go, oh, that yes. wandering and lion, it almost got me. That son of a bitch. Uh, not like humans. I mean, you know, they go, oh, that bastard. I'll go get his ass. You know, yeah. it, it's over. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. the important part of all of that is we're not saying that you, that it's not, we don't feel the feelings. But it's almost no. like feelings are waves. And instead of resisting it, the wave comes in, it's felt, and then it goes out again. It's only in the resistance that, that these issues yes. are created. Yeah, and it's the reaction. Yes. It, it, yes. It's, it's a response yes. versus a reaction. You know, once you get, you get rid of that emotional load, then you don't react anymore. It's more a response. It's a more logical response uh -huh. instead of a reaction like, oh, no, you, oh, you dirty, no good. Da, 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 da. You know, that's a reaction. And, and that's when you have something buried in there that needs to be dealt with you know, yeah. when you're reacting. And, and are you reacting to somebody who has the same kind of traits in them that you don't like about yourself? Yeah. Yeah. And so, yes. And so response is I can have a feeling I don't like what you're saying. Maybe you're saying something really terrible, but I'm not having this emotional overload. Identity's gone. I could just say, please don't speak to me like that. I don't like it. I still have my own presence, my own power, and I can still watch the sunset. And this, this, it's a sensation. It's it's very beautiful. And we're gonna we want to name it and and express it. And that can there's some beautiful positives to that. Don't where you there's beautiful positives. Um. But those words will never be the feeling. I'm just trying yeah. to communicate something to you. And I think poets and all that are beautiful. So it's a beautiful sensation. And so now I just enjoy it before I'd be naming it. I'm probably taking myself out of it half the time. Oh, how beautiful. And look at the sunset. And I've had many spiritual journeys and experiences. Oh, isn't this wonderful? And, rah, rah. and the feeling would be gone. Yeah. And I remember doing a meditation and, they, and I got, because you keep naming it. You to think your attention moves elsewhere, just be in the experience. Yes, yeah, I really understand that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so that's what we're doing. That's why if a client says, I don't know the feeling, um, or they give a word, we don't stay at the word. We it's they know the sensation, they know what it means to them. We don't even analyze what words they're giving us, it's what it means to them, but that's the sensation that they know i've had a lot of clients that will say i don't i don't know what i would name the feeling good i don't need a name you know the feeling though don't you and they go yes because we don't analyze anything we don't get the client to analyze anything you can't analyze a feeling edward de bono he was right 
And that's where we're getting a little bit crosswise. A lot of truth is pointed, but we're getting a bit lost. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm I'm asking questions for myself, but I'm also thinking, well, okay, what are the people watching this? What are they gonna want to know and ask and maybe have difficulty with? Um Yeah. So, I think the, the go on. No, please go on. What I've noticed for most people, what they're wanting to understand is they are aware, the very nature that they're listening to even your podcast and people are searching and listening to, you know, in Jerry's platform is they are trying to solve a problem. Deep down they know. What is the problem? They have a negative thought or feeling or a behavior that's getting in their way. They don't like the feel of it. And therefore, deep down, they know there's more that is possible for them. I suppose what we're really communicating is life is always evolving. And this piece of uh, natural laws has come together, put together by John Mace. Um, and he was never identified as for the person. He said, don't worry about John Mace, just get it out there to the people. So where I'm going to get him only using it to acknowledge is that here's a piece that's come that you do not have to live with them. It is not a self. It feels like it, but it's not you. And we can help you discreate all the effects of those negative thoughts and feelings. Not integrate, not manage, not analyze, discreate. The only thing that mucks up a computer in its own natural system is a virus. So we can liken these little energy ridges, negative identity to a virus. It's mucking up your natural system. And so what they're, a lot of clients are aware. They've done all the therapy, the theorizing, and yes, it opens up doors and perception. Lots of great things. But they're still going and still looking because that feeling is still there. Or it acts out somewhere else. They're aware. So this is the piece in their journey that in the experience they can discreate it. They don't have to live with it, analyze it. There's a lot of people say, but if you don't have your negatives, you know, you've got to have negatives to know the positives. Come back to your non-dual. There's only that. You do not have to live with negative thoughts and feelings that are repeating. And they are aware that it's repeating. That's why they're looking. That's why they're still seeking. And that's what, uh, you know, so Jerry is is walking with people who've had extreme trauma, yeah. extreme trauma, that that's the manifestation. And he's gone in there to work with them and he started to explore what is happening for them. But he was still looking for the key. He's seeing patterns. He's seeing, you know, from where life was shining his point of view. We've all got a point of view um, where we're looking. So, of course, and it brought him towards Mace. Here's a piece that's going to help you with what you have seen. So it's the same for everyone. No matter what doorway they're coming from, and especially if they're coming to your podcast, Lucinda, and listening and wanting to learn and to Jerry, is, is because they're, there's a piece so how many how many practitioners are there of mace? Are, are they all so? Around? Yes, we've got you know um, it's been a big journey in its own. There's lots of practitioners out there. You know we um, on our main website. I think there's about twenty five. There are heaps of practitioners that were trained way before. So John started twenty something years ago. I've been doing it for seventeen. And I know I've trained about 50. So they go off into, you know, doing what they're doing, but there's a collective of us that are coming together now to move it forward as a collective. Um, and John Mays passed four years ago now. And, um, you know, so there's been a different sort of movement that we're coming forward. But there's a lot of inquiries and... Um, you know, I'm, I'm training all the time and it's just, it's, it's one of those grassroots movements. I think even you picked that up, Jerry, 
John created yeah. it for the people, and it's the people that have moved this forward. We are where we're at because of clients, our everyday people coming and, and, and coming across it. And what I find is that it's got its own movement and how people come towards Mace, how they find it, are the most delightful stories, myself included. So it's almost like um, it, it's having its own movement. And I have to say, Jerry, you know, in you sharing and especially working with people who are dealing with these type of manifestations, you know, they're big beings underneath as all of us. And they're just having a bit of a hard time trying to handle the trauma that they've lived with in their life um, is that it's getting more and more attention because you're out there talking about it. And so there are, I've had inquiries from other therapists, um, everyday people, because we're people first. We're all looking because we're, we're still noticing there's something there. That's wisdom. I think that's marvelous. And, and so looking for the pills. I've had a handful of clients that did real well with this and they go, well, I want to learn this, you know, yeah. so I ship them your way, you know, like, yeah, I want to be able to do this yeah. after experiencing. Do you, do you have people, Sherry, that you've not, not been able to yeah. help? And there's the nature of our being. Yes. Probably three in 17 years. Wow. The very first principle, the very first, um, what we say to all clients, is the only thing that will stop this. Well, let me rephrase it this way. The only thing to help this to work for you is that you want to change something. Yeah. If you don't want to change anything, then there's a point. And what we mean is because it's the simple power of you. I'm not here as a therapist in the conventional sense. I'm a guide. I had the experience. And I went, wow. And so I wanted to train so I could guide others so they could discreate what they're not to. And so that's what we're trained in. You know, there are the principles, very much natural laws, how you're made up. There are some premise shifts, but through the training, you are going to discreate a lot of negative identities that you don't even know there. The very nature of the material, the very nature of life and living, and because your attention's on it, 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 it that's what it does. It's very experiential. <coughs> you end up discreating these energy ridges, and so there's more and more of you that comes forward and more and more of your life changes and the flows, and it's, it's wonderful. It's life-changing. And by the time you're certified as a practitioner, you know, you don't have any triggers in the sense of that you're at the effect, you know, a client might be dealing with something quite severe. That in, I have done counselling prior in my life as a counsellor. Um, you know, you hear a story and it's like, oh, I feel that, but you've got to put it to one side. You know, all the techniques you're taught as a counsellor. Um, but you see from a very different point of view when you're coming from the real you. Mm. And so I have had clients say certain things, you know, they have shared it. It's like, it's okay. Because I know deep down, it's not them. It's not a self. I don't tell them that. It's like, I can help you with that. So if you just follow these simple steps, as Jerry was saying, we explain so you feel safe. And what we're doing, it's just naturally how you're made up and follow these simple steps. And I'm a guide more to help your, it's almost like I'm a bit of a, <coughs> John Mace, try... I'll point this way. John Mace wanted to know why it couldn't be a self-help. We've had a lot of clients that will go out there and try it on themselves. I was a self inquirer I came home and, and tried it myself as well. And, um, because that's the nature of who we are, and I respect that. Um, and, of course, I was a little cockeyed when I went back to my training, and I said to John, I feel a little bit cockeyed today. And he said, oh, 
you went home and tried it on yourself, didn't you? And I went, I did. He said, good, <laughs> close your eyes. But I got the answer to what that is. <laughs> so when you've got a problem, what? so he was exploring what that was. And life always mirrors. And his computer got a virus. And, of course, he uh, could be fixed from within the computer or whatever his little system was, Norton Antivirus, we'll call it. And he rang a computer guy and the, he had to clip his computer in, to, you know, plug his computer into John's computer. And he was doing something. He said, why are you <coughs> attaching your computer to mine? He said, I'm going to get my computer to get your Norton Antivirus to see that there's a virus there and then it'll do it. And there was John's answer. Yeah. So that's what I am. I'm just here to help. We help point. I don't want to say too much so we don't trigger things. Um, to point to it, you locate it because you know the feeling, the unwanted feeling. And then we use the therapy or the, the principles of the mind, which Jerry talked to you a little bit earlier. It will create an image and picture of what those feelings and sensations represent to you. But we don't analyze the image. It gives you something to look at. And then there's the, nat the natural discreation process begins. So our role is to help keep you separate from that as that happens naturally, to keep it simple. I mean, the rest you can read John's book and it is all written in there, absolutely. <coughs> so Jerry, <laughs> that's with, really... With, with the kind of people that you work with, there, there must be layers and layers. There must There's so, so much for these people because they're so so tormented and have had such difficult lives and lots of trauma. That's the ones I work with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's one thing after another thing, after another thing, but usually it's the big stuff that we handle first because that's yeah. the first thing that they want to, that's what their spirit wants to go for. So it goes after the big one. And then once they feel the relief from <coughs> that, you know, then, then we go after all the other ones down the line, but it's their, energy being that chooses i don't choose you know they they pick and and we go after those ones and and yeah i've had i've had several who their voices are gone completely gone mm -hmm. and one gal was uh, uh she had two or three voices and she wants to become a mace practitioner they're gone she went on to be a trapeze artist so she's swinging from you know, jumping through the air and grabbing this trapeze on the other side and swinging to, you know, to the other, going from being a, a schizophrenic, hearing voices and tormented to being a trapeze artist. So what's amazing about this stuff is it works. You know, unlike all this other stuff, it actually works and it works fast and it's, and it's fairly accurate. So how can, how can people find a mace practitioner then if, if, if they want to try it for themselves? Uh, so they can go to the international website, um, www.maceenergymethod.com, and there is a directory there, and they can click on that. And we have practitioners in the UK, US. Most of the uh, of us are in Australia because it's an Australia. You know, John Mace was Australian, mm. um, and there is one in Canada. Uh, so, but they just go to the directory, and we're there. All our sessions can be done on Zoom um, or, you know, when I first started, we could do phone sessions or in person. Then in came Skype. And now I have people say, what? So, you know, we've got um, lots of ways of connecting. It doesn't have to be in person. Yeah. I do a lot of overseas. So, yeah. 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 So and just if, go if there I, and visit and feel drawn to one. If I wanted to train or somebody else wanted to train as a MACE practitioner, would you go, does it, does it have details on the website for if you wanted to do that training? It yeah. does. Or you can go directly to the Causism Institute, the body of knowledge, John coined as Causism. <clears throat> so you can go to causisminstitute.com and that is more for the training. Um in the Mace Energy Method practitioner. Okay, great. But each link, each website links to the other. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. And, Jerry, and I have a lot of, yeah, I have a lot of information on 
schizophrenia on my website too at jerrymarzinski.com or you know there there's stuff there for people who are struggling with the voices that that we provide free great so any yeah. last words from you jerry anything else that you'd like to let people Me? know well yeah. I'd, I'd say it's it's the voices that drive paranoid schizophrenia it's it's not any chemical imbalance it's nothing genetic it's nothing you know it, it's a voices it's a spiritual battle and mm -hmm. the, this mace stuff works great for you know light to moderate schizophrenia and it doesn't work so great with the more regressed ones but that's better than <laughs> that's better than anything else out there as far as i'm concerned yes definitely yeah okay. any last words from you sherry um i suppose just trust in the simple power of you and people listening you know they're not doing anything wrong they're trying to find the solution but the problem is not them the problem is these energy are grateful that Jerry stumbled upon it and is taking it to people. John always said that the research had been done. You know, it's simplicity and it's data. But where it can go to help people is what he always said, we will get to see, he will not. And, um, you know, I am getting to see it through Jerry. John would be very tough, Jerry. <laughs> because patience is heartwarming. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for giving so much of your time. I'm really, really grateful. Thank you. That's brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. And thank you, Lucinda, for giving us the opportunity to communicate and share that there are this, there is this possibility. Yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Hi, everyone. If you like asking questions like me, please like and subscribe. Thank you.